Hey everyone, today we're going to pull the curtains back and expose the worst decorating mistakes that can do the most harm to your home. The too small rug mistake is one of the easiest design mistakes to make for three reasons. The first, when you're buying, obviously the smaller rug is cheaper, so it's always very tempting to go a little bit smaller. The second reason is that many people just don't measure before they buy. And the third reason is that many people simply just don't know what the general guidelines are for rugs. So let's go over them. When you're considering buying a new rug, first of all, always place out all your furniture first where you want it to be and then measure for your rug. For a living room, an area rug should fit under all of the key furniture pieces. You should be able to fit at least the front legs of the major upholstered pieces on the rug. The back legs can be off if necessary. Typical living room rug sizes are 8x10, 9x12, and even 10x14. For really large rooms, you can also use different rugs to create different zones, provided that the rugs coordinate well together. In the bedroom, for a queen size bed, the most typical size is an 8x10, but if your room is on the smaller side, you can use a 6x9 as well. For king size beds, the most typical rug size is 9x12. For a dining room area rug, make sure all your dining chairs fit on the rug and get a rug that extends at least eight inches out from each side of your table. If you already have a too small rug and you're stuck with it because you just bought it or for whatever reason, there is a fix. You can save the day by layering your too small rug on top of a larger rug. Jute rugs work great for layering because the big sizes are affordable. They're a lovely neutral toned base and they match with pretty much anything you place on top. Layering also works really well for situations where you've fallen in love with a rug that's a little too small for your space, like a vintage rug for example, or maybe because you're saving up to buy a new large rug for your room but you're not quite there yet. When you push your big upholstery pieces up against the wall, it creates a big empty void in the middle of the room. This doesn't look good, it isn't effective as a layout, and it makes socializing with others in the space awkward as well. Here's an example of a good before and after where this problem gets addressed. Even in smaller rooms, if you don't have enough space to create like a pathway between, for example, your sofa and your wall, I still recommend pulling your upholstery pieces off the wall, at least by a few inches, just to give it that feeling of like breathing space. The ideal socializing distance varies between culture to culture. But generally in North America, a comfortable, friendly socializing distance is between two to four feet. If you're forced to be closer than that, it can feel a little weird, unless you're on like more intimate terms with that person and anything further away than four feet can also feel awkward. Definitely try to remember that sweet spot when you're organizing the layout of your furniture. 98% of the homes I see have their curtains hung in a way that designers would define as wrong. If your curtains are floating above the ground, they're hung wrong. If your panels look skimpy, they're not adding to your room's look. If your rod is hung too low, unfortunately, that's also wrong. And finally, if your rod doesn't extend out enough past your window, that is also considered wrong. I do get why most people don't like hearing this. Getting curtains right is super annoying. It's a hassle to hang them. And if you mess it up, it's, it can be expensive to fix. Curtains are an incredibly important element of a room if you're gonna use them, so it's really a shame to not get them right. And remember, when we say wrong, it's not to pass judgment of any kind. Um, it's not to make anyone feel bad. It just means that the curtains are not helping the room look its best. I've done two full videos on how to hang curtains, so I would recommend going to check those out if you want more information on that subject matter. So what is bad art? Bad art is anything that doesn't work with its surroundings and that you hung simply to fill a space on the wall. The best art is exactly the opposite of that. It's art that looks good with its surroundings that also has some kind of significance to you. Look at how well integrated these art pieces are in these spaces. Each room pulls colors from the art and the furniture and wall colors are also in the same general color family as the art which makes it all feel really cohesive. From an interior design standpoint, of course what you hang on your walls should be at least somewhat in harmony with the surroundings of the rest of the room. But to truly nail your art game, that's not quite enough. The art should also be meaningful to you in some way. 
So meaningful art doesn't mean that it has to have some crazy, unbelievable backstory. Just try to find one extra reason to hang a piece of art beyond just the painting matches my sofa and you're good. And just a reminder, the cost of the art on your walls is totally irrelevant. You can buy your art at Home Goods, at Walmart, or at the Salvation Army. It can be a print or it can be an original. So long as A, you love it or like it, and B, it looks good in your room, you're golden. Some art that I personally tend to stay away from are mass-produced prints of recognizably famous paintings and landmarks, altered classical art, that's just a huge personal pet peeve of mine. Also those black and white photos where just one element has been left colored or like landscapes with super saturated colors like sunsets. I find that stuff kind of cheesy, but again, that's just me. If you love any or all of those things and they work with your interior, then you do you. But Viv, what happens if I love the art but it doesn't work with my room? Well, then maybe that piece should be the jumping off point for the rest of the scheme in your room. Take cues from the colors and bring them into other elements of your room like the throw pillows or textiles to really make everything sing. Think real hard before you spend your hard-earned cash on a big ticket item with a crazy pattern or a wild, unusual color. A sofa's a pretty big purchase, so chances are you're probably gonna wanna hold on to it for a longer period of time. I promise you, it's the absolute worst when two years after you've bought it, you start having cold sweats because you know deep down you're over your pink sofa. And then every time you look at it, you begin to despise it just a little bit more until your sofa becomes nothing but the physical manifestation of constant regret and the reminder of all your bad decisions. And this is why I always recommend going neutral on your big upholstery pieces. Neutral is classic and elegant, and it's the perfect backdrop for playing with pattern and color on smaller, less expensive pieces that won't make you cry if you decide you don't like them anymore. If you are dying for that patterned accent chair and your heart is set on it, just make sure you go into the purchase with your eyes wide open, knowing that you might get tired of it sooner than you thought. If you're not worried about your taste changing or you're convinced that you can just resell your purchase a few years down the line if you get tired of it, then go for it. Having only one light source in a room, for example, a light that's placed right in the center of your ceiling, is a very common design mistake. Unfortunately, there is no single light source that is able to fulfill all of a room's lighting requirements alone. Well-designed lighting schemes include layers of different kinds of lighting, namely ambient lighting, task lighting, and accent lighting. Ambient lighting is the general overall light that fills the room. You get your ambient lighting from overhead light sources, either with one fixture or several, from sconces on the walls around your room's perimeter, from cove lighting, and light from your windows and skylights is also considered ambient light. Task lighting is what you use when you need to focus on something specific. So for example, when you're reading, hopefully you'd have a lamp nearby, or when you're preparing food in the kitchen, you could have, for example, under cabinet task lighting. Accent lighting is about highlighting things that are already in your space, like art on the wall. And as a general rule, your accent lighting should be about three times brighter than the surrounding ambient lighting for the best impact. It's also worth noting that sometimes your task and accent lighting is bright enough to produce ambient light on its own. The point is, don't just use one light bulb. If you're about to tile a new backsplash or lay new tile in your bathroom, the worst thing you can do is spend weeks and weeks agonizing over what tile to pick, what pattern to lay it in, and then leave the grout color as an afterthought. Your grout color should never ever be a last minute panicked decision. You may be thinking, well, that's easy. I'll just go with white tile and white grout, classic. How can you go wrong? Well, you can. First of all, white grout does not stay white forever. Most people that choose white grout actually end up regretting their decision a few years later. So keep this in mind. If dirty grout drives you bonkers, just consider that you may have to go to great lengths in order to restore the pristineness of your white grout. So you may wanna save yourself the headache and consider going with a gray or a beige instead. And then let's talk about this example. This homeowner had her tiler painstakingly lay out this beautiful white tile in a beautiful spiral pattern, and then she chose a white grout. 
unfortunately, as you can see here in the image, the pattern completely disappeared with the white grout because she picked a grout that didn't provide any contrast. Halfway through the job, she realized her mistake and she was super upset and then she had to mess around, wasting a bunch of time and energy trying to figure out how to fix it. Give your grout the consideration it deserves. That's it from me today. I really hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.